Um, so today the panel is called It Was Bad Before Trump, Islamophobia and Muslim Political Prisoners. So what does that mean, it was bad before Trump? There's a lot of outrage now about the Trump administration's very Islamophobic, anti-Muslim bigoted policies. Um, there's certainly a lot more overt racism in his policies, in his cabinet picks, in his administration. But many of these policies are actually a continuation of um, not only post 9-11 policies, but uh, specifically anti-Arab and anti-Muslim policies that um, were sort of rooted in the Clinton administration. You know, you have the terrorism bill in 1995, and that sort of paved the way for all these other violations of our First Amendment and civil rights. Uh, and, uh, and this, of course, was exacerbated after 9-11, which gave uh, the U.S. government the green light and, you know, social pressure and approval to have more targeted campaigns against Muslims. Um, and so you started seeing more, uh, you know, violations of our uh, civil rights, of First Amendment activities such as free speech, charity, and so you're going to hear about some of these cases today. Uh, we have Nico Pellet joining us. He's going to talk about one of the greatest travesties of justice in America, the case of the Holy Land Five, which are five men who are literally spending 65 years in prison for charity. The government itself doesn't say that they ever, you know, sent any dime to support violence or terrorism or anything, that it's just charity. But um, I'll let him speak about that. Um, and then uh, we have Maryam Abu Ali, she's the sister of one of the earliest cases of extraordinary rendition victim. Um, Ahmed Abu Ali is her brother. He's one of the longest prisoners held under SANS. It's short for Special Administrative Measures. As I told many of you yesterday, it's literally like being buried alive. He was held in the most uh, punitive and restrictive prison where Timothy McVeigh were very high profile offenders um, were, are, are being, are, were being detained or are being detained underground, no communication with the outside world. And we have Dr. Melva Underbaki, uh, the executive director of the Coalition for Civil Freedoms, which um, is holding this panel today. Uh, as I said yesterday, we were focusing on the prisoners uh, who are either entrapped or targeted in FBI sting campaigns. This one is more directly political, you know, prisoners that weren't entrapped, they were just targeted for their background, their uh, religion, their heritage. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, read Miko Pellet's bio for you and we'll turn it over to him. Miko Pellet is a writer and human rights activist born in Jerusalem. He is author of the new book, Injustice, the Story of the Holy Land Foundation Five and the General's Son, Journey of an Israeli in Palestine, which highlights his transformation from a Zionist to a Palestine solidarity activist. Um, uh, Mr. Pellet has traveled extensively and gives talks about his experiences to audiences across the US and the world. Uh, before he begins, I really can't tell you enough how amazing his book is. It's a wonderful book, very, very well written, very thorough. He's an excellent researcher, and I encourage you to buy the book. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Lena, for the introduction. Thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure to be speaking on this panel. So, um, just as was said here, it was bad before Trump. It was bad before Trump. I mean, it's worse now, but it was definitely bad before Trump, as many of the people on this panel know, and many of you know. And when I, um, when I heard the story of the Holy Land Foundation for the first time, it wasn't actually that long ago, it was about five years ago when my first book, The General Sun, had come out, and I was in Dallas giving a talk. And after my talk, some people came up to me and told me about this case. And my first reaction was, it's, a, it's really not something that makes sense. The story doesn't make sense. Um, then I decided to learn more about it. And the more I learned, the more I decided to uh, talk to other people and share. And everybody I spoke to, the reactions were very troubling. The reactions were either my reaction, which was, it's impossible, these things don't happen, or even more troubling, if this happened to these people, then they must have done something. <clears throat> Another reaction that I found very troubling from people who, do, who did know about the case and were involved in civil liberties issues, 
and civil rights issues was that, um, well, it's a long time ago, you know, there's nothing we can do, we gotta forget it and move on. And when you think about five innocent men in federal prison for lengthy, you know, serving lengthy sentences, to leave it alone and just forget is a horrifying idea. So these, because I found all these reactions so troubling, I decided to write the book. And the more I researched, the more I realized this was not only an injustice, but it's, it's, it's an enormous story. And it's a very complicated one because there's so many different layers to the story. There's the personal issue, the personal story, the personal tragedy of five good men. And when I say five good men, I want to be absolutely clear that that is an understatement. These are the five best men you will ever meet. And perhaps many of you know them, some of you know them. But these are, without a doubt, not just five good innocent men, but the five finest men you will ever meet. Um, and so that's one story, their story, their family story, this terrible tragedy that, that uh, fell upon them. The other part is the issue of the justice system. And Americans like to believe that there's the justice system in America is honest and clean. And of course, perhaps there's a mistake here and there, but basically it's honest and clean and that there's no political persecution and there are no political prisoners in America. Now when I say Americans like to believe this, I'm speaking about white privileged America. If you talk to members of the black American community, they know that political persecution has existed for a very long time. If you talk to Latinos and other minorities, of course, they know that political persecution has been part of American heritage really for a long time, and that the justice system is not honest and clean, it's politicized. But white America doesn't know this and doesn't want to believe this. So I thought it was extremely important. And that's the second aspect. The second aspect is illegal and, the, and the, how the justice system worked when it came to these five men. And then the third aspect has to do with the politics, Israel, America. The government of Israel and the government of the United States and how they collaborate, and why they collaborate to a point where five men, in this particular case five men, are put on trial, convicted, given incredibly long prison sentences for something that they may or may have not have done 10,000 miles from here. It has nothing to do with America or Americans. Why is America taking part in this fight, in Israel's fight against the Palestinians. Why, is political, why are Palestinians being persecuted in the United States? Not that it's justified when it's in Palestine, but in some strange way, it's understood. Here, if, why are they being persecuted here in the United States once they've left their country, they left their homeland, they started a new life, why is this going on? So those are a lot of questions that have to be answered. And they're not easy answers. It took me about five years to write this book. I probably read, I know I read more than 20,000 pages of court transcripts. And if it was up to me, those, all of them, all 20,000 would be included in the book. Of course, the publisher wasn't going to have that because it would be a book this big. But the reason it's so important to read, and some of the court transcripts are in there, the reason it's so important to read this for me was that it's not me my story, my perspective, you know, me Capellan saying this. You need to see what happened in a courtroom. You need to see how the, the, the witnesses were questioned, how they were cross-examined. You have to read it to believe it, because if somebody told you this, you could, it's impossible to believe unless you sat there. The absurdity, the absurdity of the witnesses, the absurdity of the claims, the absurdity of the evidence that was presented and the absurdity of the convictions in light of the fact that all the evidence and the witnesses were so ridiculous. So how do you put all that together? It was a tough job. We got it done. I had a, good, a lot of help from my publisher and editors and so forth uh, to help me put it together. But um, it's an unbelievable, unbelievable tragedy. It's a story that is so sad that it, every time I read it, and I've read the manuscript many times, um, I find it heartbreaking. So the story itself, the story of the persecution, is a story of persecution of Arabs and Muslims in the United States. Um, and this was a case that was incredibly important. 
because, of, because this was the largest Muslim charity in America. And it was well known. It was developing uh, alliances with other organizations. It was well respected. Um, they did good all over the world. I mean, their focus was Palestine. But they had programs for orphans. They had programs for victims of human and natural disasters. They helped the poor and the needy everywhere, including here in the United States. And there's a quote that I got from uh, a social worker in Gaza that was describing just how important, how significant their work was. And after they were closed down, it had enormous impact on the life of the needy in the Gaza Strip. And that's just one example. Um, you know, they helped after 9-11. They were there after the Oklahoma City bombing. Tornadoes, floods, like I said, human and natural disasters. And they were all over the world. They would volunteer, they'd be the first ones there. And because they were so good, and because they were honest, and because they had such a solid reputation, they had to be brought down. There's a reality, a political reality, and this has everything to do with politics, my friends. I, we have to talk about politics because this is political persecution. And this is all about politics. If these men were not Muslim Palestinians, they would not be in jail. If they were not Muslim Palestinians, they would not be in jail. This is all about politics. And the political reality here in America, and I don't have to tell you this, Anything that's Palestinian, particularly Palestinian, has to be somehow connected to terrorism. There can be nothing that's Palestinian that is not somehow connected to terrorism. Sometimes they call it anti-Semitism, but it's basically terrorism. So if you want to put, to put on a play by a, Palestinian, excuse me, by a Palestinian playwright or a Palestinian writer, you're not going to find a place because it's Palestinian, which, it's, which means it's terrorism. Um, some of you may recall, a few years ago, there was an exhibit of children's drawings from Gaza. Any place that tried to display that exhibit, there was an uproar. How could you possibly display this terrorism? Children's drawings, but it was Palestinian. Anything that has to do with promoting solidarity for Palestinians is, of course, terrorism. If you talk about the right of Palestinians to resist, well, that is obviously terrorism. Everything has to be related to terrorism. But there was this one area that was somehow untouched, and that was relief. Relief work, charity work. And the Holy Land Foundation was run by Muslim Palestinians with a focus on Palestine, and they were doing the one thing, of course, they didn't realize this, but they were doing the one thing that scares this political structure the most this Israeli-American political structure. And that is, they were, there was the beginning of a crack in the narrative. And the narrative says, Palestine is terrorism, Israel is good. Very simple. Well, they were showing another side of Palestine. First of all, they were just showing that there's a need, and so people are starting to think, well, why is there a need? Isn't Israel taking care of these people? I mean, they're the ones in charge. That's number one. Number two, they were themselves Palestinians. This was a Palestinian organization, and they were doing incredible work. They had alliances with international organizations. They were getting awards and prizes, and they were there on the ground. So in other words, the proof was in their work. So they had to be brought down. Now, it's not something that comes to mind immediately. I mean, you have to have some level of creativity to conflate relief work with terrorism. It's not something that comes to mind naturally, right? Somebody had to sit in a room and say, we're going to say that these guys are terrorists. Now, how are we going to do it? Let's think about this. It doesn't come to mind immediately. But in the early to mid-1990s, the biggest gatekeeper of this American-Israeli political structure, which supports Israel, the Anti-Defamation League, the ADL, which pretends to be a civil rights organization, really it's a fascist, right-wing, very dangerous organization, if you ask me, they began to sow doubt, to, to spread doubt and rumors about the Holy Land Foundation, that they're connected to terrorism, 
that they're connected to, I don't know, all kinds of uh, Muslim conspiracies to bring down the United States. They were connected to Hamas, that they were doing this, that, and the other, and that they were funding Hamas, that the money that was coming to them was going to support terrorism. And they went to the IRS to try to revoke the, uh, their not-for-profit status, and on and on and on. Newspaper articles were coming out. The, the FBI was notified and began an investigation. So this was already brewing as early as the mid-1990s, even before Hamas became a designated terrorist organization in America, even before it was illegal to do business with Hamas. And, of course, then 9-11 happened. And this gave an opportunity to bring down the, the HLF, the Holy Land Foundation. That's what brought about the opportunity to bring down the Holy Land Foundation. What's interesting is this. After 9-11, there was a sense, and I talk about it in the book, there was a sense that you know, something had to be done. There was hysteric, hysteria, panic, and so on. We've got to do something. And so round up the usual suspects. Holland Foundation was said, you know, was right up there. High profile, Muslim, Palestinian, perfect target. Close them down. So December, by December, mind you, 9-11 was September. By December already, George Bush stood up and closed them down and declared them a designated terrorist organization. So that's a designation, and froze their assets. But here's what's interesting. They weren't worried. They were not concerned. I spoke to them. I spoke to their lawyers. They were not concerned because they did everything right. Their taxes were filed on time. Every penny that was donated could be traced exactly, and you could find out exactly where that penny went. There was no question in their mind that they did everything right, and therefore, it's going to be all right. They were not concerned. This is America. When you do things right, you're going to be okay because the system works. So they hired a good team of lawyers, they sued the government, which is what we do, you know, the government acts arbitrarily, we sue the government, and you know, we fix it. They prepared a very serious file demonstrating precisely what I just said, that they did nothing wrong, that they paid their taxes, where the money went, they never supported any political or military organizations, and so forth. Very compelling. The government presented what's called an administrative folder. And the administrative folder is how the government explains why they did what they did. It had no statements under oath. Nothing was uh, dated or clearly uh, authorized. Newspaper articles. Copies of documents that were faxed over by the government of Israel that was translated, wrongly it turned out. Nonsense. I won't, say, I won't use the word that the lawyers used out of respect for this audience, but to describe the contents of that folder. And so, and so off they went. They went to court and the judge dismissed the case and struck the evidence from the record. And I'm sitting there with the lawyers and they're telling me this and I said, what do you mean? The judge can just dismiss the case and, and that's it? and strike the evidence? And the lawyer said to me, well, that's what she did. Now the problem with that is this, and I'll give you one example. I mean, it's obviously problematic, but I'll give you why, one example why it's very problematic. One of the documents that was sent over, faxed over, and poorly translated from the government of Israel was a statement that was made by the Holy Land Foundation's manager in Jerusalem, a Palestinian. And according to the statement in the government's file, he said, we actually did give some money to Hamas. Well, that's a problematic <laughs> statement. So they contacted his lawyer, a very well-known lawyer in Jerusalem, and asked her, they said, what is this? She said, I have all of his statements. He said no such thing. She sent over his statements. They were translated, notarized, signed under oath, and he said the exact opposite. But the correct translation was in the evidence that was struck out of the, struck from the folder, struck from the uh, file. The wrong translation was accepted. It was in the government's file. 
So they appealed. And the appellate court said, well, perhaps she should not have struck the evidence. However, and this is, again, I'm sitting in the, with the lawyers, very smart guys, men and women. Steam is coming out of their ears as they're describing this to me. However, this is not a normal case. This is a case that involves national security, and therefore, the lower court's decision remains. And that's when they understood that in this day and age, Muslims, Arabs, Palestinians do not, will not get a fair trial. In America, Muslims, Arabs, Palestinians will not get a fair trial. That's when they understood this. And then they realized the government was preparing a criminal trial. And they thought, where's the crime? Where's the crime? They did nothing wrong. And this is where the ingenuity comes in. This is where whoever it was that sat in the room and said, we're going to conflate charity with terrorism, came up with the idea. You can't make this up. Hold on, I went too far. Remember. This is where, this is where you can't make this up. Holy Land Foundation had a program for orphans, where they supported orphans in Palestine. The government said, these orphans are the children of terrorists. If you support them, not only are you supporting terrorism, you're encouraging terrorism. Because if a person knows that their family and their children are going to be taken care of, they're going to sign up to be terrorists. I mean, aren't we all? The first thing we do is we'd sign up to be terrorists if we knew our kids were going to get 100 bucks a month. Some kind of a you know, charity relief. This was said in the court of law by PhDs, terrorism experts, people who sit in think tanks and advise the President of the United States, and then show up on CNN. This was said by experts, that not only is this support for terrorism, this was encouraging terrorism. Fine. The defense took the list of orphans and checked what was the cause of death of the fathers? None of them died as a result of what you may call terrorism. I went the other way, and I checked with a list of names of uh, Palestinians who participated in suicide missions in Palestine when suicide missions were taking place, some 200 or so. None of them had children. Either way you look at it, these orphans, had nothing to do with what you might call terrorism. But why ruin a good story with a fact? And this is the Northern District of Texas, so here we are. Next thing they said, they're supporting the families of prisoners. An incredibly, incredibly important thing in Palestine because there, Israel holds thousands and thousands of Palestinians in jail. The families need support, so they had a program for that, and many other organizations do, by the way, and even today, you may have heard they just passed a, a, a law, you know, something about not, they're going to stop sending money to the Palestinian Authority because some of the money goes to support the families of prisoners, which they call terrorists. This is happening now, too, this absurdity. Now, why are they, these people in jail? Obviously, they're terrorists. Israel says so. And if Israel says so, by the way, in the United States, that's it. But if you look at the list of Palestinians sitting in Israeli jails, you're going to find that the vast majority of them have not been charged with acts of violence, have not been charged with what you might call terrorism. They're political prisoners. They're political prisoners. Most of them involved, or many of them involved, in, in resistance, which is nonviolent, you know, by definition, resistance. But, again, why ruin a good story with the facts? So today, we have five good men, like I said, sitting in prison. The first one I'm going to show you, Abdurrahman Ode, um, from Patterson. And I was talking to a gentleman earlier today out there who knows him, also from Patterson. Abdurrahman Ode had nothing to do with the running of the Holy Land Foundation. He volunteered on missions, he did some fundraising, he contributed, he donated money, he ran his own uh, pantry, a soup kitchen in Patterson. And here's the amazing story. And you talked about entrapment earlier. 
Very early on, when the investigation began, he was approached by the FBI, and they were asking him to come work with the FBI. And he said, no, thank you. They knocked on his door at 5 o'clock in the morning. They stopped him on the way to work. They came to his office over and over and over again. And he said, no, thank you. They brought Arabs who are, who are member, you know, FBI agents who are Arabs. He said, no, thank you. Finally, they said to him, you're going to pay. You're going to regret this. You're going to be blacklisted. You will not be able to make a living. He said, Allah provides. I'm not going to When the trial began, he was offered a deal. If he pleads and agrees to a gag order, he could be out in three years. So he thought about it. And he said, OK, so you want me to plea, which means I did something wrong. And that will reflect on my other friends and my other brothers. I will be bound by a gag order, which means I won't be able to speak. No thank you. They came back to him with another offer. You'll be on six months. Six months on terrorism charges. He said, gag order? They said, yes. He said, no thank you. I'm sitting with him in the visitation room in federal prison. He's wearing the khakis. You see the, the prison-issued uh, khakis. He can't go to the bathroom without permission. And he says to me, alhamdulillah, I'm a free man. I sleep well at night. He got 15 years in federal prison, an innocent man. He could have been out in six months. And the other guys, the other brothers said to him, take the deal. He said, alhamdulillah, I'm a free man. I sleep well at night. The next one, some of you may know, Hamd al Mazen. He's really like, he's the sheikh. He's the one who knows the Quran by heart. He's a well educated man. He was kind of the inspiration, kind of the spiritual inspiration behind the whole thing. And uh, also, really had nothing to do with the day to day running of the organization, but he was one of the, you know, one of the people who inspired the idea to start the foundation. And he would do fundraisers, of course, and so on. So again, I'm sitting with him in federal prison. Really a respectable man, Tarram, really a respectable man. Older gentleman, he's not well, but he's strong. Every young prison guard treats him like he's a kid, come, go, you know, like he's nothing, okay? We're sitting there. Now, I met him last time, or one of the times I met him was just after Donald Trump was elected, and you may have heard Ted Cruz and a couple of other senators wanted to pass a law that would add the Muslim Brotherhood to the designated terrorist list. Regardless of what people might think of the Muslim Brotherhood, I'm not going to get into that. I do get into it in the book, though. And this man is sitting in front of me, looking right at me, and he says to me, I am a Muslim brother. They cannot change who I am. He's a free man. 15 years in federal prison. He's completely innocent, and he's sitting in front of me, fearless. Fearless and free. Third one is an even more interesting story, Mufid Abdul Qadir. Mufid Abdul Qadir had nothing to do with the running of the organization. He would volunteer, sing songs, he's got a great voice, do fundraising. Had nothing to do with the running of the Holy Land Foundation. However, his brother's name is Khalid Mash'al. And some of you may know that Khalid Mash'al was for many years the head of the political bureau of Hamas, really the face of Hamas, for many, many years. And in the trial, the prosecutors kept saying, well, you know, we can't, uh, we can't convict somebody because of his family. However, family connections are very important. <laughs> they said the exact that. They said one thing, and immediately after that, they said the other. They brought experts to show how important family <coughs> connections are. He hadn't seen his brother in probably 30 years but they found some phone records or something that they spoke on the phone. So Mufid, after the first trial, and there were 32 charges, after the first trial, he was found not guilty on all charges. His wife showed me, said to me, he, the judge read, not guilty, 32 times. Then when the prosecution polled the jurors, one of the jurors suddenly woke up and said, no, 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 I made a mistake. I didn't mean it. That was not my intention. So regardless of what the foreman said, regardless of what the defense team said, 
The judge called a mistrial on him as well. He's in prison for 20 years, in federal prison for 20 years. In the second trial, they tweaked the indictment, they tweaked the charges, changed the story a little bit, and he's in jail for 20 years. Third one I'm going to tell you about is Shukri Abu Bakr. And Shukri was the lifeblood, the engine that ran the Holy Land Foundation. He was the engine that ran the Holy Land Foundation. And the book is dedicated to his daughter, Sanabit. And you'll have to read it to find out why. However, eh, the prosecutors in the trial said one, one big portion of their proof of their case was Hoyland Foundation was established in 1987. Hamas was also established in 1987. Aha! <laughs> See the proof? <laughs> what they left out was this. The first Palestinian uprising, the first intifada, also began in 87, and there was an enormous need for relief. Thousands of prisoners, countless killed and injured by the Israelis. There was enormous need for relief. Second thing, Shukri's daughter, Sanabel, was born. And she was born with several diseases that required a lot of medical care, and that's when Shukri was really for the first time involved and, and, and got to see what the, the, this, the whole world of charitable giving and medical care that, 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 that becomes available as a result of that. And he decided he wanted to make that available to children in Palestine. And that was the inspiration for him to start Farland Foundation and to dedicate his life to it. But the prosecution didn't add those elements. 65 years. 65 years in federal prison and an innocent man. 65 years. And the last one I'm going to tell you about is Ghassan Ilashi, which for some reason that I cannot explain, I uh, was denied uh, permission to visit. Uh, I can't explain, I don't know why. I applied many, many times. Uh, and, I, and they kept denying me. Also, he was, the, he, was, he was the president of the organization. I'm not paid, you know, he was, you know, he and Shukri together worked a lot, did a lot of important work. He went, when the, when the, during the Clinton administration, they decided to uh, designate Hamas, another organization, this terrorist organization. He came to Washington, D.C., had a meeting with top officials in the Treasury Department to try to figure out what's going on and what they can do. Didn't really matter. There was nothing, there was absolutely nothing these men could have done that wasn't done. There was nothing the team of lawyers could have done that wasn't done. Second trial, like I said, they changed the story. And the way they changed the story is interesting. They, like Lina was saying, they changed the story from saying, well, obviously, they did not give money to Hamas or to any other terrorist organization. But they worked with local charities, and they are controlled by Hamas. OK? Where's the proof? The CIA vetted these, they're called Zakat Committees, the local Zakat Committees in Palestine. The CIA vetted them. The State Department worked with them. USAID worked with them. The United Nations worked with them. The Red Cross worked with them. Everybody in the world knew them to be good. The Consul General, the American Consul General in Jerusalem, testified on behalf of Holy Land saying the Zakat Committees were fine. There was nobody ever said that they were on any list. They were never placed on any list. So they had documents sent from Israel, again, wrongly translated facts, no dates, nothing. And they had two witnesses, anonymous, foreign nationals, that were allowed to testify as expert witnesses for the first time in the history of the United States. This was never allowed before. And even they couldn't explain, because none of the Zakat committees were on the terrorist designated terrorist list. None of their board members were on the designated terrorist list. In fact, these guys didn't even know their board members. They never even visited the offices of the Zakat committees. But you know what they said? They can smell Hamas. <laughs> they don't need proof. They can smell Hamas. That was the kind of evidence. That was the kind, these were the kind of witnesses that were brought to this trial. So, first trial where well, there were no convictions, second trial, all convictions. These are the prison sentences. So they went to appeal, and the appellate court said, you know what? In the second trial, the judge, there were certain, there were certain uh, 
evidence and witnesses that were allowed in the second trial were not allowed in the first trial. The uh, appellate court said the second judge should not have allowed those pieces of evidence, should not allow that testimony. However, what is it with it? however? There's always a however in this story. <laughs> however, they were harmless. So the defense team, what do you mean to say harmless? No convictions, all convictions. Here's the difference. That's it. No answer. The Supreme Court wouldn't take the case, obviously. It's too political. Who wants to deal with five Muslim terrorists? President Obama was petitioned to commute their sentences, and there was a campaign, and there were several countries that were willing to accept them and give them citizenship. After all, these are good men. Who wouldn't want them to be in their country? Who would not want men like this to be citizens of their country? President Obama wouldn't deal with it, of course. Too politicized, you know, that would be the end of the Democratic Party. So they're still in jail. What's going to be done? I don't know. The only thing that I can see that can create some kind of hope, that can bring down this pyramid, is if we start at the top, which is the Israel-U.S. relations and Israel-U.S. policy regarding Palestine. The only way to, because these guys are political prisoners because they're Palestinians. Like I said earlier, if they're not Palestinians, if they were not Muslims, they'd be free men. That's, I, that, I believe, is where that started. And how that happens, we can talk about um, at another time. So thank you all very, very much.